Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Lisa Dooley. I am the president of the SSWBN. I'm so excited to have everybody here tonight because this is such an important topic. Um, you know, we are the Social Women's Business Network, but we believe that um, your emotional and physical wellness allow you to be your best business person, right? So this is such an important topic and we're so thrilled that Marcia is here to talk to us. So thank you again for that. Um, the reason we, um, we're, we're recording this so that we can share it, um, we do have a YouTube channel. Not everybody knows that. You can look us up on, um, on YouTube. Um, we are continuing to, to add more content there because this is part of the value add of what we do as an organization. You can go back and look at other meetings that you've missed. Um, and there's other content there that we're going to be sharing. Um, we just did a wonderful uh, event on real estate a couple of weeks ago. Um, we've done talked about taxes. We've talked about um, bookkeeping. So a lot of great content that's shared. Um, the SSWBN, and again, Michelle, I know you're, you're a guest. We, we welcome you here. Um, the organization has been around for a very long time, since 1991, and when it was really sort of the first women's networking organization, So Sure Women's Business Network. Um, we um, have evolved, um, as all a lot of organizations have, and uh, we are an all-volunteer uh, board. We do not have any um, administrative overhead, um, and our goal is to, um, to really provide the, we call them the four Cs, which is contacts, right? Uh, other people within the network and, and throughout our membership and our guests. Um, we ask, uh, we always encourage our members to collaborate with each other. I have done uh, collaborative events with a number of people, um, with Laura, with other members of the organization, um, and it's an opportunity to collaborate, bring your strengths together, and that's so exciting for all of us. Uh, we also like to talk about coaching. Um, there are a lot of people in this organization um, who have a lot of experience in different areas. It might be a business area, it might be a personal area. And so we always are so excited when our members can coach each other. And sometimes it's as simple as, hey, you know, if you sh save your contact information in a Word document, then you can just copy and paste it. People love coaching. So congrats. So, so two thumbs up to all of you who learned how to do that because that's how we learn to do better, right? We don't know what we don't know in our businesses and our lives. So, so that's the kind of coaching that we, we love to encourage between our, um, um, during these events and, and certainly offline as well. And the last piece is community. Um, we are um, a 503 503C charitable organization. And it is an important part of our tenant that we give back to the community. So every quarter we um, pick a, a charitable uh, charitable organization. Um, we have this quarter, we are supporting Annie's Kindness Blankets and they will be joining us at our quarterly breakfast and they'll share about them. So we do do some fundraising through raffles at live events, which are coming up. Um, so speaking of that, so we have some great live events coming up. I'm going to throw this over to Michelle, who is our event chair, and let Michelle talk about um, our upcoming events and get us started. Yeah, hello, everybody. Um, so Michelle Werdeman, and yeah, so we actually have our first live event coming up in June, and that is actually going to be at Lisa's house. It's, she has a beautiful front porch. Um, I was actually a presenter there back in October and it's a great spot. Uh, we're looking forward to actually seeing people, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna, that's gonna be a lunch and learn that's gonna focus on how you can use the equity in your house. We have another one of our members that's gonna give a presentation about that. So I believe, you know what? Uh, I just closed my book by accident. It's June 8th. 8th, yep. Yeah, yep. Tuesday, yep. Yep. So that's up. Um, that's up on the website. You can go register there. We then have June 24th. So that's going to be our virtual breakfast. As Lisa mentioned, we're going to keep those virtual. Um, and we're going to talk about diversity and inclusion in the workplace. So that's going to be, it's so relevant now with, you know, just kind of our environment and whatnot. Um, July, we have our next in-person will be, it's a lunch, no, excuse me. It's an after hours, it's gonna be a wine tasting and we're gonna have two members. So we have one of our members that does the Scout and Cellar. We're just gonna sample different wines, but at the same time, one of our other members is gonna talk about the importance of like your credit score, how to, if you need to increase it and just really like how to kind of, you know, build it if you need to, or just learning. And it's a great way, I think, cause learning about credit scores, maybe, you know, not the, peppiest of topics. So incorporating it with a little bit outside, a little bit of wine tasting will be fun. So that is also up on the website. So feel free, you can go ahead and uh, register. 
Um, so do you want, Lisa, did you want to do, do you want me to introduce Marcy or do we want to go around and I'll kind of. Yeah, that's why, yeah. Why don't we go around and just tell, you know, everybody do sort of their two minutes about who they are. We'll end up with you, Marcy, so that you can start. Um, and you can talk, are you doing a screen share? I should have yes. asked you. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. So you were set up to screen share. Um, so I'll just start because I'm here. Um, Lisa Dooley, again, um, I am president of the um, SSWBN. Um, I am a professional organizer and I should have put that in my title. Um, I am a professional organizer. I am based um, here in the South Shore. I help both residential and commercial clients um, find more space, more time and more joy in their lives and who doesn't need all of that. So if you know someone um, that needs some of those or all of those things, um, please do think of me and you can find me in the member directory at the um, SSWBN website. Michelle? All right, so I am, thank you, Lisa. I am a, again, Michelle, it's certified life, weight and career coach. I am also a certified financial planner and I worked in corporate America for 19 years and founded my business a few years ago because I wanted to kind of take the best of the financial planning aspect and the emotional aspect that goes into finances and then also how to deal with difficult emotions. Um, I help women, not just with financial wellness, but also emotional wellness because a lot of times, I think specifically to women, you know, we let fear, anxiety, stress, overwhelm kind of hold us back. So I like to coach people on how to deal with difficult emotions and become the creator of their life versus the reactor. And I love that I can bring my financial planning background into that too, and also help women just basically take control of, you know, their, their finances or know what's going on. Cause I found working where I worked before, a lot of the women didn't know and they didn't know what they didn't know. So that's another area that I love to coach on and just learn to help educate people. So awesome. Thank you, Michelle. And it's interesting. We talked to, we were talking about some of the upcoming events. Um, our events are intended um, to educate our members, right? Because I don't, to use Michelle's phrase, I don't know what I don't know. I don't know how my credit score might affect my mortgage or my cable bill, believe it or not. Sometimes they pull your credit in order to do that. So I think that's such an important idea is, and if you know someone that you think might be a good presenter or um, and bring an important topic forward, um, that would be wonderful. Please do share it with us. And you can always reach us to us at info at SSWBN.org. Mary Ford, how are you? I'm good. I'm unmuted for a change. <laughs> I'm reading myself. Um, no, I'm great. I am, um, I'm a retired newspaper editor. And I have an editing, uh, writing, coaching business that I'm um, running, but I'm also a newly published author, which is really exciting. So I've been working very hard on my marketing of that. And I'll definitely donate a book for the raffle. That would be great. Oh, love that. Thank you. So excited about Marcy's presentation because I should own stock in Weight Watchers. <laughs> Over the years, I have tried everything and um, Jenny Craig, but Weight Watchers is the one I always seem to go back to. I've met a lot of friends there. It's like a support group, but yeah. I'm, I'm all ears, mouth, <laughs> scale on this one. So um, I look forward to it. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mary. Michelle Holloway, thank you for joining us tonight. Yeah, thank you again for having me. Um, so my name is Michelle Holloway. I come from a background in the hospitality industry. So I work for hotels, dining and entertainment establishments. Um, but I recently, you know, post COVID um, joined the team over at Liberty Mutual. So I'm based out of the Rockland office, currently working from home, but that is my home base. Um, and we work closely with the Southeastern office as well. So essentially what I do is I like to take care of people on a personal note. Um, but what I've been doing is just reviewing insurance um, policies. It's funny. I've been reviewing my family and friends. No one really understands their insurance <laughs> policies. I'm sure you're, everyone's like shaking their head. No one understands. I didn't understand it until I took the time to get the courses, get the licenses. Um, so it's interesting. I just want to help people. So if you would like me to take a look at your quotes, I'm happy or your policies, happy to do that. Any clients that you may have that may benefit from that, um, obviously do a uh, Liberty Mutual quote, but what's also great is we work with other carriers. If Liberty Mutual is not a match for you, we're not going to, you know, put you into something that doesn't make sense for you. We work with Travelers, Progressive, and a few other carriers as well. So that's what I do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And you're right. It, it is one of those, um, we know 
we know we need it, but we're not really sure why we need it. Right. Mm -hmm. It's one of those. Yeah. It, and it's, it's kind of like you check the box, like, okay, I did it. Exactly. And um, you're almost afraid to ask questions. So that's um, note to self. That's a great topic. Mm -hmm. um, it is. It's just it's exactly yeah. what you said. We, we, you know, we need it, you know, we may use it, we may not use it, but we need to have it. So have it. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you again for joining us, Laura. Nice to see you. Good evening. So I'm um, Laura Bradeen. I'm an independent agent with um, Primerica Financial Services. And I, it sounds like I have a similar venue with Michelle. Uh, one of our basic um, products or services that we do is life insurance. And it's true. Everyone's brainwashed to think I must have it, but they don't really know how it works or why they have it or how much they should have. So yes, a big piece of what I do is educate people about those kinds of services. Same thing with retirement accounts. People, yes, I have a 401k, but they don't know how it works or how much they should have in there before they retire. So do a lot of educating. Um, so it's, I, I put the whole list of what we do in the chat because it's a long list. It's, we hope, we kind of think of ourselves as the one-stop shop for your financial services. So there's a, a lot of different related items uh, and services that we provide concerning your finances and the safety of your assets. So, uh, but I'm really excited. Uh, in, uh, in Primerica, we're allowed to build our own team, which is something I haven't really put a lot of effort into. So I just, I just uh, had a, a young guy join my team in the past couple of weeks. Awesome. And I am a licensing coach with the company. So I'm the one that helps people get their first license, that life insurance license. So he's getting licensed because <laughs> I'm going to make sure. And so I'm kind of excited about a new, almost like a new chapter in my business here. So, um, and I got a couple other, two more, even younger guys that are interested. I don't know. We'll see what happens, but I'm, uh, I'm glad that I, I seem to be moving forward with uh, with my business in a different direction, and I'm kind of excited about it. So that's awesome, Laura! Congratulations, building a team and um, you know being able to um, build a wider platform is huge. So it, it gives gives you that wider reach, and I love the fact that you said you're making him learn and get his licenses because um, it's always a question of does this person really know what it is they're talking about when we're asking those questions? So thank you for that. And thank you again. Congratulations. That's awesome. Thank you. Lynn Feingold. Laura, you're on a roll. It sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> so exciting. And I can tell you're just full of energy. I love it. Um, I'm Lynn Feingold, virtual assistant. And uh, I worked for Dunkin' Donuts corporate headquarters for more than 30 years as an executive assistant. And now uh, I have decided to hang up my shingle, as they say, and be a virtual assistant. And so I work from home and I work for people all over the country. I have a lot of fun meeting people. I love to talk with people and find out what they've got going on with their business. I often say, please bring me your chaos and I will just help you straighten it all out. And um, that is what I specialize in. Been doing a lot of writing lately, much more writing than anything else. Uh, press releases, creating social media, designing, um, you know, web pages and things like that. But it's been a little bit of everything. But I'm really enjoying all of the different things that I'm learning to do. It's kind of a crash course, but I'm really enjoying it. Thank awesome. you. Congra and congratulations on launching the business. And I think it's interesting. It's like we learned something and then we're able to take it into that next part of our business or a different part of our business. Right. And that's, that's the building of the skills. Um, and, and I think that's so huge. So congratulations on that. Thank you. So welcome everyone. And now I'm going to turn it over to Marcy, please take okay. it away. Uh, thank you. And thank you for allowing me to talk about this topic tonight. It's something I have a lot of passion for. Um, so I, like many of you, started in a different career. I was in corporate America for quite a while um, in technology and consulting for over 25 years. And I, somewhere in my mid-50s, I sort of turned my own health around and got really excited about how that happened and the impact it made on my life. And so I went back and was trained as a health coach. And then a year later, took my boards and um, started my own business. So that's what I've been doing for the last five years. And I love it. So I always wanted to do to work for myself, but um, just never took that leap. So 
Uh, it's very exciting. And this, this topic is very near and dear to my heart um, because it's something I struggled with from a, from a very young age. And I'm, I will tell you uh, some of my own story um, as, I, as I get going. But if, could we, could I share a screen of my? I think you're good to go. Have... Why don't you try that? I think I enabled it. You did, great. Oh. Always having to move things out of the way. Oh, no. <gasps> okay, just bear with me one minute while I figure out where to put my little gallery window. There we go. Okay, so um, the title of, of this is The Truth Behind Emotional Eating and Yo-Yo Dieting. And I added a hint here that it's not your fault. And you'll see in a minute why I, um, I put that there. Oh, okay. So this, this is kind of inside the mind of an emotional eater. And you may or may not relate to this personally. You may or may not know of someone who would relate to this personally. But one of the reasons I think this is such an important topic is because this is something, as you'll see in a minute, I'm gonna share some statistics with you, but this is something that so many people struggle with and they do it in secret because there's a lot of shame associated with it. And so, you know, I, I talk um, to a lot of people in the corporate world and I tell them, you know, you need to look out for this on your teams. This is, you know, there's a big focus on mental health these days, but this is not an area that's getting any visibility. And I think it's an area that needs to, you know, come out of the closet, so to speak. And so over the past, um, I was coaching weight loss for several years. And then over the last, I'd say year and a half, I really the last year I decided to completely pivot my business and focus on helping people who struggle with emotional and binge eating. And um, I, in the process, I kind of had to out myself. And I, um, I do some, I do regular like weekly emails, like a newsletter to um, my mailing list. And I got, I've gotten such interesting feedback from people like, oh my gosh, I never thought you would have struggled with that. You seem so buttoned up and in control all the time. Well, let me tell you, it was very messy in there. <laughs> so um, these are just some of the common things. I, this is sort of inside the mind of an emotional eater. So very, very common, um, these two large statements here, which is why don't I have any willpower? And what is wrong with me? And then there's questions like this, you know, why did I just eat all of that? You know, why can't I just stop eating? Or, you know, oh, I was, I was bad today, but I will be good tomorrow. You know, like just carrying all that emotional weight around every single day is, is very exhausting and, and very, very difficult. So if, if you'll bear with me, I'll tell you a little bit of my story, um, which I think helps illuminate the problem or the issue. Um, I, you know, I grew up in a very loving home. Um, my, my mom was the quintessential Jewish mother and, um, or I guess you could fill in Italian, Greek, whatever, any culture where food is the center of everything, right? So I learned, you know, if I came home from school and I got an A, oh, come have some ice cream. You did such a good job. If I had a headache, it'd be, oh, Marcy, you must be hungry here. Come have something to eat. So food was always the answer to everything. So, you know, as a result, I learned to self-soothe with food. Um, when I, um, you know, so I struggled off and on and I tried every diet and, um, you know, I can remember as a young child overhearing my mother say, they were gathering, we were away and they were like, oh, let's take the kids for ice cream. And they didn't know I was in earshot. They were like, oh, where's Marcy? Someone has to go get Marcy. And my mother, who was so loving and so accepting, I heard her say in the sharp, critical voice, the last thing that child needs is ice cream. So to me, ice cream became this forbidden food 
And to this day, it is a trigger food for me, you know? Um, so it's just so interesting how our experiences with food and with our families really shape uh, our relationship with food. So when I turned, so when I turned about 50, um, I was not able to have children, but we adopted a 12 year old out of the foster care system when I was 50. And I was her third legal mother. And I was working a very high stress job at the same time. And we brought this child into our lives. And I will tell you, it is hands down the hardest thing I've ever taken on. And so my stress went from elevated, I'm pretty type A to begin with, to off the charts. And that's when I really discovered, you know, the real strong, compulsive, um, you know, need to, to use food. I, I call it to self-medicate, basically, food and wine. Um, so she would go to bed and I would shove all my emotions down my throat. Um, you know, we would bond over nachos and pizza because that was the food that she liked to eat. And then after she would go to bed, I would hit, I never had junk food in my house before, but all of a sudden I had a 13 year old. And so I would hit the Oreos and the ice cream. And then I would run out. I would wake up in the morning and be like this. I can't believe I did that. Oh my God. You know, as opposed to waking up, oh, what a beautiful day. You know, I did not wake up with gratitude. I woke up with regret and guilt. And I, there were times I ran out of the house at five, six o'clock in the morning before everybody woke up to replace the Oreos and ice cream or whatever the heck I had finished. So nobody would know what I had done. So um, that's a little bit of my story. So um, I just wanted to share that and sort of set the stage. And um, my, if you take nothing away from this talk tonight, other than willpower is not the answer and trying harder is not the answer. And that's what I hope to convince you of in the next 30 minutes or so. Okay. So first let's look at some statistics. Um, so 75% of the US population is either overweight or obese, 75%. Um, approximately 75% of people who overeat are emotional eaters. And I'll talk about some definitions in a minute. Up to 30% of adults seeking weight loss support meet the criteria for binge eating disorder, 30%. Uh, women and men are affected equally. Um, this one surprised me when I learned this. 40% um, of sufferers are male. Um, binge eating disorder, uh, BED, is more common than breast cancer, HIV, and schizophrenia. And that's why I said what I said in the beginning about how this needs more light shed on it because it is so much more common than people understand. Um, please, oh, by the way, um, please feel free to interrupt me or ask a question at any point in time um, if you would like. Okay, so first let's talk about what some of these terms mean. And also I think of emotional eating as being on a continuum. So on the left, you have what I'll call a healthy relationship with food. So what does that mean? Um, I always say, believe it or not, because it's hard for me to wrap my head around. There are some people for whom food is just food. You know, they even they're hungry. They stop when they're full. They don't obsess about it. They don't think about it all the time. They don't know how many calories are in an apple <laughs> or a donut, you know, and they just it's just not something that they worry about. Think about it's just food. Um, I put this line here because everyone emotionally eats a little bit, at least most people do. And some amount of emotional eating is perfectly healthy. Um, so then here, emotional, all emotional eating really is, is eating in response to a heightened emotion. So you're stressed so, and when you're not hungry. So it's a form of self, self-soothing, um, a way of distracting yourself uh, and you know, there's some hormone, hormonal things that go on where you get like a hit of dopamine. So it is, it is a bit like self-medicating. Then at the other end of the continuum, you have 
the actual Our eating disorder. Part. Yeah. Can I just ask a quick question? So sure. where would you put, you know, um, before this, I've, I've, I've written 50 notes. Okay. Firstly, um, but um, where would you put like, when we say I need comfort food, right? So I'm, I've had kind of a bad day, right? So it's like, you know what, tonight a salad is just not going to cut it. I need some mashed potatoes and I need something, you know, I, this is definitely, so where would you put sort of, I, I call it comfort food um, on this, on this sort of continuum? So it depends on what else is going on. If that's all that's going on, if, if, if that same person is going to leave a, fa um, a fight with their partner and go down a pint and Ben and Jerry's ice cream in five minutes flat without remembering hitting the middle of the pint, then I'd answer differently, right? But if, if all it is is what you said, then I think that's, that's in this area over here. That's, that's why I say everybody eats emotionally. So some of that is you have memories from childhood, you know, when you, you came home from maybe school and, and your grandmother was visiting and she made a special kind of soup that filled an aroma in the house. When you want comfort, you're going to go for that soup. You know, that's sort of a programmed response. Can I just say something real quick, Lisa? I think it's so funny you bring that up today for lunch. We went out to eat and I was like, I'm just so sick of salad. I want comfort food. I was like, do you guys have grilled cheese? <laughs> I was like, or I'm like, or baked potato, something different. So it's funny. Yeah. So when I get to the slide about diet culture, if I don't remember to bring these examples up, remind me. Okay. okay. It's very, it's, it's actually a great example what you just brought up, Michelle. Um, okay. And so the binge eating disorder, I mean, people along this, along the continuum may binge, they may overeat. Um, the binge eating disorder is just, it, it's like um, you binge, meaning you eat aggressive quantities of food in a short period of time, usually very quickly, often without tasting it, um, in certain time periods, X number of times a week. So it's, there's like an actual definition that, that goes at this end. And I would say when I got to that point with my daughter, when things got really, really tough, that I, I probably made it all the way down here. Um, and yeah. Any other questions on the slide? Can I just make a, um, a comment, Marcy? Uh -huh. I, I've been dealing with various kinds of emotional eating, comfort eating for a long time. One of the things that I've come to realize for myself personally is, and it, I don't think it quite is at the, the you know, the BED end, but um, my mother grew up poor. And when I say she grew up poor, there were days when there was no food in the house, not real food. Like her father worked at a candy factory. So there was always the, the um, uh, what do I want to say, the defective candy in the house. But there were days when there was no actual real food. And um, her mother occasionally would send her to the neighbor to ask for a couple of pieces of bread. And if she got the bread, then she, should, she was supposed to ask for something to put in there. It was, it was that severe. Mm -hmm. And so obviously that affected her mm -hmm. and you know her mentality about food and, and poverty or whatever. And um, so I know that like there are days, that, or I'm better now, but I, I have recognized that I, have, I had a fear of being hungry. Not that I was hungry, but I was afraid that I afraid that I would be hungry. And I realized I inherited that that mentality from my mother. And the way that she would um, you know, she never ate dessert. She always had seconds of real food. Mm -hmm. And she always had lots of food mm -hmm. so that we wouldn't run out. And then we felt compelled. And so I got that idea. Now I'm now I feel compelled to eat it. <laughs> because <laughs> I can't waste it. And so, so it's a whole, it is an emotional type thing, but I, I, I inherited it from my mother. Yes. It's, and it's, uh, but I have, you know, I'm, I'm getting better dealing with it because I recognize now the source of it. And that's very insightful of you. And that's another great setup for some of the things we're going to talk about, because it's, Almost everything, all of our triggers, you know, things that cause us to emotionally eat, 
you can trace them often back to something from childhood, some experience, um, some trauma, and often um, there, there's actually an exercise that I do in my program, it, which is not, I didn't make it up. I mean, it's, it's um, done in a lot of habit changing programs where you look at the fear and you look at the truth. And once you can recognize the fear is happening in you and you can stop, slow down, take a breath, tell yourself the truth, then you can potentially move on and change your, your behavioral response. So that is very insightful of you and a great example. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and actually we're just about to talk about some of that. So I could spend a few hours on the slide, but I promise you I won't. And, um, but emotional eating, this is, this is the beginning of my argument for why this is not about willpower. So there's some real heavy science going on here. Okay, and I put it into three buckets. Um, one is mindset, and this is your limiting beliefs, your attitudes, and basically our, your behavior is shaped by the experiences that you or your family members who influence you had as children. So um, you just you know gave us a, a great example of that. So. Um, so mindset is a huge, huge piece. And um, another piece is biochemistry. And the biochemistry is, um, this is things like you have, um, you have too much sugar for breakfast. You wake up, pardon me, that was a judgmental statement. You wake up for breakfast, you have a glass of juice, a cup of coffee, and a large muffin. So what you've just done is loaded your body with your with a ton of sugar mm -hmm. and it, you're gonna spike your blood sugar. Your, your hormones are gonna go a little bit around in circles. And then around two hours later, an hour later, you're gonna crash and you are going to physically crave sugar. So the biochemistry piece is, is actual physical imbalances in the body that cause cravings, okay? And, and the, the problem with all of these areas, um, which is all very fascinating when you look under the covers, is they're all little cycles. They're all little vicious cycles. So you eat a lot of sugar, you get a spike, you crash, you crave, you eat the sugar, you spike, you crash, and around and around you go. And this is when people say I'm addicted to sugar, sugar is an addictive substance. It, you know, you get feel good hormones, your hunger hormones get crossed. It's, um, it's very interesting. And hunger is another one. So sometimes people who restrict, um, you know, I forgot to mention this on the other slide that I talk about the prevalence of this problem. This has nothing to do with whether you live in a larger body or a smaller body. So people who live in smaller bodies have this problem as well. I have several clients who have significant disordered relationships with food, who have binging issues, who have emotional eating issues. Their relationship with food is very messed up, but to look at them, they look thin and fit. And it's just because they're really, really good at restricting. They binge restrict, they binge restrict, they restrict, and then they can't stop eating once they start, then they restrict. So it's, um, you know, has nothing to do with size. Okay, so that's biochemistry, but I'll just tell you that hunger, when you get too hungry, that again, sets off a cycle in your body of craving. Okay, the neuroscience piece, this is where the magic happens, people. The neuroscience piece is fascinating. So basically, we're just little computers, right? Our brains are amazing. And our brains and our stomachs are very connected. But basically, when you all have it is, is sort of like a, a neural pathway in your brain. And when you repeat something over and over and over and over again, you strengthen those neural habits and those neural pathways, and those are what become habits. So the more you do something, the more ingrained the habit is. So the good news is anything, I'm an old uh, computer programmer, years ago, anything that can be programmed can be reprogrammed. That's the good news. You can literally 
rewire your brain. And so at the end, I'm going to I'm going to tell you sort of what the model looks like for how you get out of this vicious cycle. But again, you know, I'll give you an example here is if you, you know, you grew up and your mother every morning put on the table a, a glass of juice, a bowl of cereal, and you had that every day. And then when you went to college, you did the same thing because it was easy. And so for 20 years, you've been having juice cereal, you know, that's a habit. It's deeply ingrained. So to change that breakfast can be really hard. And that's not about willpower. That's about neural pathways, right? So um, this is why I'm always saying to people, give yourself some grace. You know, you didn't, you didn't come up with this habit overnight. This is a journey. It's a healing journey and it takes time and it takes patience. Um, so what you what you need to know is all these. I'm not going to try to overcomplicate this, but these there's so many little cycles in here that feed each other, um, and I'll, I'll go into one of them in a minute. But they they can set each other off too, you know. So um, example, you you always have popcorn when you go to the movies, right? So that's both a mindset issue because your experience is you 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 go in the movie theater, you smell the popcorn. And you, it reminds me of your youth and boom, you want, you buy the popcorn. It's also a habit. Anyway, so let me keep going. Okay. So with emotional eating, it's not about the food. It's not about wanting to eat. It's about feelings. Okay. So this is, this is the sort of general cycle that happens. You have heightened emotions and that could be you know, for me, it was typically stress. For other people, it could be, you know, loneliness, procrastination, boredom, despair, you name it, you know, fear. Um, but you have some sort of heightened emotion that triggers, I use the word binge here, but it could be just overeating. Um, that then triggers typically feelings of guilt and shame, some sort of negative feeling about yourself, which is a heightened emotion. And around and around and around we go. Does this, does this resonate with people? Yeah. Totally. Yeah. That's a, one of the things like I coach on in my practice, it's dealing with difficult emotions. Yeah. I was thinking and, when you said that. Yeah. yeah. And it's kind of like that think, feel, act cycle. And you can't create positive actions if you're having all these negative feelings. Mm. And it's usually when you have the negative feelings, what do you do? I refer to it as buffering. So whether it's eating or drinking, it's only going to create like this cycle. It's so, yeah, I love this. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> when I talk to my clients as well, you know, um, it's shopping, right? It's, it's something that distracts us. So I think the mm -hmm. first step is always awareness and dealing with it. So I'm in a right. heightened emotion because I'm sad or I'm unhappy or I'm stressed or whatever you know, you can reach for, you know, uh, your Amazon cart, or you can reach for a glass of wine, or you can reach for, um, you know, the exactly. Oreos, right? To use it. And so it's something that it, it is, it, it really is self-medication. And really the first step is to acknowledge those heightened emotions. So how do you get people to do that, Marcy? Ah, that's interesting. We'll talk a little more about that at the end, but I mean, sometimes you have to just sit with the feeling, you know, I'm sure Michelle, you know, could, yeah answer this one, but uh, a lot better than I could, but sometimes it, you, you, you have to learn to feel your feelings. I mean, it's like literally shoving them down your throat is temporarily distracting and numbing, but then the, the feelings are still there. You haven't solved the problem. You haven't felt the feelings. And oh, by the way, now you've complicated it because now you're all mad at yourself, which just makes it that much worse. Mm -hmm. Um, so a big piece of it is just recognizing it, giving yourself the space, stopping. Um, I, I'll give you an example. I, I'll use myself so that it's, um, you know, I don't make it personal for anyone else, but, um, I, I grew up with a very critical perfectionistic father. So I, he would, I literally had the father where if I brought home a 98, his response was show me the two things you got wrong. So you won't get, you'll get them right next time. He meant well, but yeah, um, he created a monster. So whenever I have to write anything, like if I have to write a paper or something like that, 
I just freeze. I'm in, you know, I literally, I'll be sitting here. I haven't started. I haven't started. I'm tense and I'm in the pantry. You know, it's like, bam. So finally it's like, I've learned, okay, what is it that I need right now? Okay. I need to let my brain breathe. I need to like, I need, I, I bought a whiteboard, you know, I need, so I, I learned some strategies that the first thing is recognizing the trigger, recognizing the emotion, and then finding an alternative strategy to deal with it. Um, so instead of the Oreos or the shopping cart or the what, you know, maybe it's take a bath, maybe it's take a walk. I bought a rebounder that works for me, <laughs> you know, in some case, if I'm really agitated, jumping on the rebounder that works for me. Um, so, you know, there's different strategies for different people. Um, I have some clients that have like a little mason jar. They have all these little strategies of things and they'll, um, we have this delay, distract, decide exercise and they'll literally, this wouldn't work for me because I need the strategy for the moment, but they, they, they'll pull out a strategy and say, Did this work for me? Oh, okay. Maybe not. And then they'll pull out another one. They'll go, okay, I'm going to go clean my closet. You know, but the point is to do something that will give you a positive feeling. So you get a little bit of that dopamine hit from the satisfaction of doing something positive. Just takes 15 or 20 minutes for a craving to pass. And then if in 20 minutes you still want to do it, then do it. But then you're making a conscious choice versus an automated reaction. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts here? I'm just going to say that actually that explains some things to me because when I'm busy and being productive and doing stuff and, you know, cause, and I like being able to be productive and get things done. I don't get hungry. So I'm distracted from that and I'm getting my dopamine hit because I'm, uh, that's cool. <laughs> that's cool. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. No, it's, it's interesting. I, I have actually had some clients that they don't even know they forgot what it feels like to be hungry. Mm. And, you know, that's a whole nother topic. So let, let me, like I said, I don't want to take too much time. So earlier I said, um, I, I would use your examples like Michelle at, at lunch, you know, you didn't want a salad, you wanted a grilled cheese. Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about why diets don't work. I mean, we hear it all the time, diets don't work, right? So um, can I just, or can we use the chat for a minute? Can people just, if I can find my chat on this weird screen, I don't know how to find it while well, I'm screen sharing. Hmm. Should be at the bottom. If you hover, can you see it, Marcy? Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. So why don't you type in the chat, um, one reason you think diets might not work. For I'm talking about for emotional eaters. I'm not talking about the person who just, you know, had a baby and needs to lose 10 pounds or someone who wants to lose 10 pounds to get into their wedding dress. I'm talking about for emotional eaters, the kinds of things we've been talking about. Okay, Michelle says, when you tell yourself you can't have something, your brain wants it more. Absolutely. It just reinforces what we cannot have. Absolutely. It can't be maintained. Absolutely. Temporary satisfaction. Absolutely. Um, denial makes you want it more. The forbidden fruit. Yes. Too much restriction. We want to eat what we want to eat. Absolutely. These are all great answers. Um, and there's this isn't true. I'll pick on Weight Watchers for a minute. I did Weight Watchers for years and I love the community aspect of Weight Watchers. Um, but Weight Watchers, like a lot of programs, okay, the biggest diet trap for a yo-yo dieter, the biggest number one weight loss trap in my mind, I've got about 15 of these traps, but is this all or nothing thinking? I'm either good or I'm bad. I'm either on or I'm off. Today's a good day or a bad day. Today's a cheat day. Today, do you know what I mean? That, that kind of thinking. Because what happens is when you're not being good, then you think I have to eat all the things before I have to be good again, right? And it just sets up this horrible relationship with food. And, and to me, that's the worst thing that 
the traditional diets do is they have all these food rules. And, you know, if you have your, I haven't done Weight Watchers for years, so I'm back in my brain, it's like you get 22 points. You know, if you have your 22 points for the day and you, you exceed them, you know, it's not great. And then you go to the meetings, then there's the shame part. You go to the meetings and you get weighed in, in front of a whole room full of people. And, and oh, by the way, the number on the scale does not success necessarily make, right? Um, and, you know, people that lost weight, they get, they get gold stars and they get like little tchotchkes and, you know, they're like the good people. And so you're like, I didn't lose any weight this week. I'm a bad person. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, that's, that feeds into, remember that cycle we just saw that feeds into that, that cycle of um, emotional eating. The other thing is that, you know, I don't know how many of you are familiar with intuitive eating. There's, um, there's some principles of intuitive eating that are beautiful. Um, for emotional eaters, it's a little tough because there's not a lot of tools to help you get to that end result. But, you know, one of the things they say is there are no good foods or bad foods. You know, you should be allowed to eat whatever you want, right? So if you want a grilled cheese sandwich, have a damn grilled cheese sandwich, right? If you're, you know, think about this for a minute. So a key question to ask yourself when you want to make a food choice is, is this going to nourish me or punish me? And what's very interesting is what can be punishing might be something different than you might expect. So I'm going to give you a scenario. You're at a party. No, you're, you're, you're going to, this is back when we all worked in offices, my example. And there's a birthday party, your best friend's birthday party. And someone's bringing in a cake. And you know that cake is being brought in. So you brought your rice cakes and your carrot sticks, right? And because you're not going to have any of that cake, right? And they bring it in and it's your favorite cake. It's chocolate mousse, raspberry, truffle, blah, 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 something or other. And, and your friend says, don't you want a piece? And you're like, no, I'm good. I'm good. You're off in the corner and you're munching on your little, you know, whatever, rice cakes and carrot sticks. And do you think that's nourishing? Do you think that's punishing? That's punishing. You know, so in the diet world, they would say, good job, you ate your rice cakes and carrot sticks. But guess what's going to happen to that person that day? They're going to go home and they're going to binge because they felt so sad and deprived. It would have been much more nourishing to have a small piece of the cake or a large piece of the cake if that's what you wanted. And that likely would have prevented a large binge later in the day, right? So this concept of nourishing and punishing is really cool. And it's actually very, very powerful when you learn how to put it into practice. Um, the other thing about, um, let me see, about diet culture is often, remember I said hunger is a huge, restricting is a trigger, hunger is a trigger. So I have a client, um, Okay, I'll, 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 I won't use the company, but it, it's a company that sells like a lot of, you know, diet, diet programs. And she's in at hook, line and sinker. She has their shakes for breakfast and lunch. She has their hundred calorie snack bags for uh, mid morning snack in the afternoon. And then she has a salad and a piece of fish or something for dinner. She's bored out of her mind with her food, right? She's not getting any what I call vitamin P. Vitamin P is a critical vitamin, it's pleasure. You need to take pleasure in your food, right? Um, so if, if you went out today, Michelle, and you, wanted, you didn't want that salad, if you forced that salad down because you thought it was what you should eat, that would be punishing. That would not be nourishing. The, the grilled cheese in that circumstance was more nourishing. And that's- and tasty. Yeah. And that's where diet culture kind of gets it wrong. Um, and the other thing diet, the traditional diets don't do that is so important is they don't address the habit loops. They do a lot of these programs do a little bit with um, mindset, 
and a little bit with habits, but they don't really give you tools and strategies for how to break these habit loops and how to, you know, systematically, which we'll talk about in a minute, identify triggers, reprogram responses, those kinds of things. So that's why I put a big red X um, on. And oh, oh, by the way, I remember this. I remember this going out to the Cheesecake Factory with friends and they have on the menu, I forget what they called it now, but there was a section of the menu like diet choices, right? And I was on a diet. So I had to look at the, I had to order from that menu and I had to say it out loud to the woman. She's like, oh, do you mean the one from the diet menu or the one from the regular menu? And I'm like, could you lower your voice, please? <laughs> so, so, and how do you think that made me feel? And I don't remember what I went home and did, but I can only imagine. Yeah, I had my salad from the diet menu. <laughs> anyway, um, any thoughts or comments here? Well, I, I think it, it does go to my, you know, I, I, as someone who has also struggled with finding what works, I do think it's, it's like anything that, um, you know, one of the things I wrote down is that willpower is finite. Willpower is a finite thing. And if mm. you say like, I, I you know, I've, I've got this wedding coming up or you know, I can't tell you how many people my age say, oh, my, my son is getting married. My daughter's getting married. I've got, you know, a month to lose this weight. So I look amazing for the, for the photos. Guarantee that weight is back on because we can only be good or restrictive for a certain amount of time, but that's not a lifestyle, right? So you right. have to find the, 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 your relation or build a relationship with food or find an eating plan. I don't like the word diet. I think yeah. eating plan. I find the eating plan that works for me forever, not for right. today, not for the next month. But I, I think it is, it is about thinking long-term and not just short-term. So I think there's a lot of those pieces, but willpower, finite. Yeah. Finite. Very. Uh, yeah. I like that. And um, thank you for bringing that up because sustainability is huge, which is why getting in that nourishing or, and, or punishing mindset is so helpful because you do need something that you can do for the rest of your life. Like I said, unless you're just trying to lose 10 pounds because you just had a baby, <laughs> but that's not what most of us are struggling with. Right. And um now I, I, my husband loves it when I pick on him. He like he, he he makes him feel special that I talk about him in these meetings. But <laughs> um, he he's a self proclaimed proclaimed food addict, and he lives by food rules. Um, so he will he I never know what which rule he's living by on which day, but he travels a lot. He's has a very stressful job. So typically he does meet. He, he's like a you know a he calls it Atkins. He's still living back in the whatever seventies uh, or whatever it was. Um, but then when he, when he gets to any sugar, watch out, like watch out. Um, and he doesn't hide it. He's not ashamed. You know, I mean, he'll sit and eat a half a pie for breakfast. Like once he hits the sugar, he can't stop. Um, yeah. So I'm like, if you just had a little bit every day, but anyway, okay. So let's talk about Okay, so if that doesn't work, what does work? So um, as I said earlier, it's a process that takes time. This isn't something, you know, you're not going to, some of these are deeply ingrained um, beliefs. Um, so the, the first thing I typically do with people is give them, um, uh, people heard of CBT? It's cognitive behavioral therapy. So there's a lot of tools, CBT tools in the habit, um, uh, making new habits uh, world <laughs> that are very effective. So um, first is learning how to interrupt the habit loops. And it, it takes time. Um, but part of that, and this is key, is um, identifying the triggers, right? And I'm still uncovering triggers and I've been doing this for years. Uh, but triggers could be anything like irrational fears, you know, like of not having enough food, for example, like we talked about before. Um, and that's not, an, that's, believe it or not, that is more common than you would think. Um, a trigger could, could just be a stressor of yours. Um, or a trigger could be something like I was talking about when I have to write something and I get stuck because 
of that perfectionistic streak. Um, so working on identifying triggers, and this is so powerful. It's so powerful. Every time I see a client like have that aha moment where they go to do the automated behavior and then they recognize what's happening and they sit down and they sit with it, like they go through the process that we put together and, and they, they don't binge or they don't like, let me just say this too. Some people binge with food, some people binge with wine. So I have some, um, but they just, wine is their drug of choice versus food being the drug of choice versus like you were saying, Amazon shopping is another one of my drugs of choice. <laughs> um, so is really identifying that trigger, then sitting with it, recognizing it, embracing it, feeling the feelings, all that stuff. Um, but another big step in the process is creating healthier responses. Okay. So for this trigger that you can recognize and you see the behavior that occurs um, when it happens and you can create a healthier response once you recognize it. And recognizing it is just such a big piece of the problem, of the, of the answer, <laughs> excuse me. Um, now this piece is, um, remember before I was talking about the biochemistry piece, so very important is bringing the body back into balance. Um, this is very, very important. I said body, mind, and spirit, but right now I'm just gonna talk about body. Um, so this is, um, you know, this is balancing your blood sugar, balancing your hormones. Um, sometimes I refer patients out to a functional medicine doctor to see if there's some X, Y, Z thing going on. Um, you know, gut health can play in here a lot. Um, so, you know, bringing your body back into balance is, is a very important piece of this. And so one of the things I do with my clients, some of my training is, you know, help people understand. I never push it on people, but when they're ready is helping them understand the difference in, um, you know, like what, what are nutrient dense choices? Some people don't, don't honestly, they don't know how to cook or they don't, don't know that you can have a breakfast that's as fast and easy as that shake that you just put water in. I, I can give you something that you can do in just as, as quickly that's probably more nutritious. Um, so some of this is just strategies and, and learning new ways of doing things. Um, and the mind and spirit is, um, you know, if you have a real issue with stress, call Michelle. No, if you, you know, if you have a real issue with stress or not being able to handle your emotions or you have unresolved trauma from your childhood, I sometimes need to refer people out to counselors for some unresolved trauma, um, but really, treating yourself as a whole person and making sure that you are whole mind, body, and spirit is a piece of this as well. Um, and this, this is really interesting. A lot of there's, there's kind of a personality type for emotional eaters. There are typically um, one, one of the women who trained me, uh, I took a training from a psychotherapist in Ireland and she was like, Marcy, you're not supposed to tell your new clients this. I'm like, why not? They find it fascinating. <laughs> but there's actually a personality type for emotional eaters, which um, um, may or may not resonate with you. Um, perfectionistic, high achievers, um, tend to see the world in black and white that you know feeds into the right or wrong, I'm good or bad. Um, typically very good at giving, not so good at receiving, very good at caring for others, taking care of things at work, taking care of their house, taking care of their business, but not so good at taking care of themselves. Um, so this is where radical self-care comes in. This is often the hardest piece for people, um, learning to put themselves first. Um, it's even hard for some people to say like that's selfish, no. You know, you've heard the expression, you can't serve from an empty vessel. Um, but learning how to really take care of your needs, if you can't do this, you're going to have a really hard time doing this, right? Because if you, everyone, oh my gosh, I hear it all the time. I don't have time. I don't have time. I don't have time. All right. Well, 
you know, when Johnny calls and says, I need a ride to the airport, what do you say? Of course, when your best friend calls and says, you know, I'm, I'm having another bad time, I need to see you for dinner, what do you say? Of course. So learning how to set boundaries so you have time for yourself is really important. I'm probably going way over. Um, okay, and then I, I put this as a cycle because it's a continuous learning and refinement. Like this is, this is a journey. This is something that takes a while. You know, there's questions you learn to ask yourself and there's a structured process you can go through to um, facilitate this process, but it definitely takes time and you're, you're continuously learning and refining and getting better at it and changing your habits. So does this make sense? Yes, great. It great. does. Yeah, yes. and I love what you you pointed out before. Like, you have to give yourself room, like, and try not to be judgmental of yourself, and just, you know, know that it is. It's just a continuous, you know, something that you'll continue to learn. But I think part of it is really like you have to just give yourself some peace of mind that there's nothing wrong with you. Well, yeah, that gets back to the beginning because everyone's yeah. always saying what's wrong with me. It's like, look at all that's going on here, <laughs> right? You're just, it, I mean, I don't like to play the victim card, but it's, it, it's, you know, there's just so much going on that's been programmed in your body that you don't even realize you have these automated responses and they have sources and the way to fix them isn't with another diet, right? And it isn't willpower and it isn't trying harder. It's, it's doing this hard work. That's, that's how you break the cycle. Um, so I just had a story that came to my mind, but it went right out of my mind. Mm. Can I, can I share something quick about Please. the radical self-care? Yeah. Cause that's, that's been something that's like way down on my list of things to do. And, um, and part of it also is, is that I say, you know, I'm not willing to spend the money on that. And so recently uh, for, for our birthdays, my daughter's birthday was the end of April and mine's coming up in the end of May. So we went away for a few days. And one of the things she did was she paid for me to have a keratin um, treatment on my hair. Because hmm. my hair was, yeah, not good. So, um, but I don't go to the hairdresser. I don't have those things done. And um, so she paid for that for me for my birthday. Oh, how lovely. And um, so, and it has actually made a difference in the way I feel. And I've decided that my nails are bad and I'm gonna go, I don't care what it costs. I gotta find a yes. and have my nails done. Good. For Good. me, this is radical care because yes. I never do these things. I don't spend the money on those. <clears throat> but yeah. um, I know already just by making the decision that it's gonna help me with this cycle. Because as you said, you know, and, and, you know, I, I'm supposed to be a financial professional. I need to look like a financial professional. <laughs> and when you're, you know, and I notice that, especially now we're doing lots of things with zoom, my appearance is even more important, not just to me, but professionally. Hmm. So I'm taking some radical care. That's beautiful. What you'll notice too is, and I can hear it just in your telling the story is, it's a mindset shift. Yes. You know, you start to see the value of, of doing these small things for yourself and, and these small things add up to, to big things. They do. Yeah. And it's those little tiny baby steps that, that, you know, that's the other thing that is a big trap is people try to change too much too fast. Mm. Yeah. Um, okay. Anything else here that comes to mind for people? I think that um, nourishing body, mind, and spirit, I mean, to me, that is just so vital. And part of that is um, embedded in that is the idea of practicing radical self-care because um, I'm going to prioritize in my life what I know I need to function. And what I need is to get up from my desk, you know, every day and go outside in the yard and, you know, spend time snuggling my cats and, 
yeah, you know, um, no kidding, you know, taking a walk in the rain once in a while or, or you know, just taking a drive. This is, you know, I, I spent, you know, days and days here at my desk, you know, getting my business launched. And suddenly I was like, wow, that that week just went by, you know, and I decided, OK, every Friday night I'm going to get in the car and drive somewhere. Mm. And where I've been going is I drive to Plymouth and I get a little takeout, you know, meal and sit there uh, and watch the sunset over the water, or I go for a long walk on the jetty, uh, you know, walk in Brewster Gardens. There's so many nice places in Plymouth where you can just, you know, unwind. And it's just the practice of getting out of the house, taking a drive. It just settles everything in my head and I'm better, you know, I feel better after I do that. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. That's, that's great. Yeah. That's a great shift. Yeah. And I think you make better choices when you start to get into more self-care and take, you know, taking care of all that, you start to make better choices in your, you know, everything, eating and yeah. everything mm -hmm. else. So I yeah, always say to my clients, does this move me closer to my goal or farther away from my goal? Right. And, and I think I love what you said, Lynn, about, and, and, and Laura about it's, it's, it's treating it. You don't have to treat yourself with food. Cause I think that's part of it is we always saw, you know, my husband said, I got a big deal tomorrow and um, I hope it's a success. We'll go out to dinner tomorrow. Right? Cause that's what we're, we were taught like that, that the food, you know, to go back to what Marcy, what you said at the beginning, food was a reward, but you know what? getting my nails done can be my reward or doing right. a nice drive or, you know, walking can be my reward. And I think that that's partly a cultural thing, to be honest with you. There's, there's some marketing behind this. There's some culture behind this. I say that to my clients all the time with clutter. This is, we are in a marketing driven society and we're told you're supposed to want food. You're supposed to want liquor. You're supposed to want cars. You're supposed to want these things. Those are our rewards. And if, and, and it is a shift to say that my reward is to take a nice walk or to get my nails done or to do something um, for myself. So yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of things that um, it's like, we're fighting the man sometimes, uh, you know, when it comes to some yeah. of this. Yeah. It's a big, I agree. Big, yeah. And I'll just add to that. You're supposed to want the bikini body. Mm hmm in time for summer that, oh, that's, yeah. that's what's <laughs> happening here okay uh, you know yeah I, I had that when i was 16. you know but it's like yeah it's it's um it's coming to grips i think as i've gotten older with realizing yeah i i'm older now and that's okay and this is what it is and that's fine that's how it's supposed to be that's you know right. And be. I'll go back to kind of what Lisa said. We live in a, in a marketing world and social media. Everything you see is revolved around food. You yes. know, people don't post, you know, getting their nails done or self-care. They post, oh, I went to this fabulous restaurant and look at this fabulous food. And that's where you want to go. You, you, you know, pin it, you check out the Yelp reviews. And that's kind of your way of rewarding yourself. Let's try this new restaurant instead of let's maybe do something for myself. That's just the way of the world we live, the, unfortunately. The, the first thing that we say to people or people say to us is you look great, have you lost weight? Right, yeah. that's like yeah. number one. And then I have friends on Facebook that if they're traveling, they send a picture of what they're eating at every meal. And it looks great or what they're drinking, but I'm just like, why do I need to know they're having shrimp scampi or <laughs> covered with mushrooms? But the other thing too is um, that eating is, is fun too. Yeah. It's part of our culture. And especially, um, you know, I think the people from Italian cultures or French food is, I mean, when we lived in my husband and I lived in France for two and a half years and the apartments that we looked at some of them did not have a living room. They just put the huge dining room table there and they'd start at noon on a Sunday and at 11 o'clock at night, they were still at the table. Yet none of them are fat. Right. Then they ate the whole time. So there's something. They had a different mindset. But I think they ate, but they ate differently. You know, they yeah. didn't have all the junk food that we had. I mean, when I was growing up, there was no junk food. So my idea of like a snack after school was, Ritz crackers with uh, Welch's grape jelly, which can be considered junk, but it wasn't McDonald's. We never had chips. We didn't have soda. Yeah. And we were told to clean our plates. 
mean, yeah, I grew up with a exactly. clean plate club and I still to this day have trouble. That's a trigger, by the Leaving way. Something on my plate. I can't yeah. do it. It's got to go. Yeah. That's, that's one of those things. I, I came from that same background and that's one of those things you can learn to overcome because sometimes, and actually this is one of the things I learned in Weight Watchers, they would mm-hmm. say, where is it better? Which trash can is it better to put it in? Your gut when you're full mm-hmm. or the trash can, trash can, <laughs> right? You know, because leftovers were, I always felt I had to finish the leftovers right. because, yeah. Well, um, but food- great. Sorry, no, like how many, do you know how many people in Ethiopia or Africa, the children are starving? Right, right. I heard that. (laughs) I think we all heard that one, right? Yeah, yeah. For us, it was China, but I know with my parents, (laughs) it was Europe. (laughs) Does anyone remember Alan Sherman? Am I the only one? He sang that song, Hello, Mada, Hello, Father. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He had another one called Hail to the Fat Person. And, mm. and about because he was if you look at his pictures he wasn't fat on today's standards but back in the 60s he was fat and he talked about how his parents told him to eat his dinner because children were starving in europe so he said when you see a fat person get on your knees to that fat person and say hail to the fat person you kept us out of war yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> What were we doing? The people in China when I was growing up were still starving, with right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, my parents were older, and my father was uh, 15 years older than my mother. He was born in 1910, mm. so you know they both lived through the Depression, and you know my father would tell stories about. You know, he'd complain, you know, that he was hungry, and his aunt who was raising him would say, "Well, you know where the apples are," and there was a big barrel of apples down in the basement. Mm. And uh, they were all separated by, you know, layers of straw and stuff. And he said, you'd go down there. And he said, by the spring, those apples were all used up. They were just terrible. They were wooden. They were disgusting. And he said, but you ate one because it was something to put in your stomach to stop it from growling. And he said, you know, yeah, there was some food he just couldn't eat anymore because he ate too much of it. I know lobstermen in Maine who grew up in the Depression and didn't couldn't eat lobster today if you paid them mm. because they had lobster for dinner every night. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because that's what they had. You know? Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. So much, so much uh, emotion is wrapped up in all of our, you know, habits about food. It's yeah. true. Today, today yes. we have the super size. Right. Uh, Wendy's, and you, if you ask for a large, it's a gallon of soda. Yes. And it's huge. Yes. <laughs> Only in America, right? Right. Yes. I'll just well, I think they're slide. doing it. I think, huh? I think people in Japan are now heavy. They might, they might, but they I think, think the sizes are there. a little smaller. Um, I'll just kind of end this slide, but I just want to pick up on something Mary said and getting back to the vitamin P. To me, food is like part of repairing people's relationship with food is food should be joyful. Food food is food is life. Food is amazing. You know, it's beautiful. It's, I mean, there's food art, you know, it tastes good. It's beautiful to eat with people, cook with people and to be able to take pleasure in food and not have it be a thing that controls you or that you feel out of control around or that you resent, you know, is um, one way to um, just live a, a fuller life. So to, to be free from that. So on that note, I'm just going to wrap us up. Um, oops, it came out in the wrong order. So I'll just put it all there. So one, I just want to ask you, um, emotional eating and yo-yo dieting are not about willpower. Do you agree with me? Yes. 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 Okay. Good. Last. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, so the other thing I just wanted to explain is there is a systematic approach that can be taken to break the vicious cycles, and it typically isn't the diet culture. And then if anyone is interested or you know someone that might be, I can put this in the chat. I do complimentary um, discovery calls. It's an emotional eating assessment to sort of see where someone is on that continuum and what a good starting point might be for them. So Awesome. Wow, that? Marcy, thank you. That that yes. was amazing. And and I think Very good. all of us have our 
you know, I always say with my clients, what's the story you're telling yourself about this object, right? Or, and, and I think for this, in this topic, it's what's the story you're telling yourself about food? Is it about abundance or is it about scarcity? And we could, ladies, we could be here all night talking about this because yes. it's such a powerful talk. Marcy, thank you. We can't wait to have you back again and to continue this conversation because that was amazing. Thank was. you. For that. Um, excellent. Um, so just in close, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, I, I will work very diligently to get this up on our YouTube page. Please look for it. Please look for the chat. Please look for um, the um, look for the link to the YouTube. It does take a couple days. That's a YouTube thing, not a me thing. And, um, and I will follow up with an email. Please go to our website, um, to the events page. Uh, portion and sign up for some of the great events that Michelle has put together. They will be excellent. Um, please join me here um, in Cohasset um, in just a couple of weeks when we do our first live event. We're super excited about that. So um, that's it. Thank you. I am going to stop the